innovation, imagination, wonder. These are just some of the words used to describe Dr. Harvey Passes. Dr. Passes explores interesting people and ideas that will stimulate you. He questions the people who develop, create, and employ novel concepts in business and everyday lives. He especially loves to speak with successful people. How did they do it? How can you do it too? So let's join Dr. Harvey Passes in his quest of wonder and curiosity as we watch Dr. Harvey Passes Presents. Recently, I was at a meeting of the New York Guild of Chefs. I love being with chefs. They're my favorite people in the whole world. You know that. I love chefs. <laughs> and while I was there, uh, they, they have their monthly meetings, and I got such a kick out of learning new things. And they had a fabulous presentation on, believe it or not, on something that is essential if you want to be a good chef. If you, even if you want to be a bad chef, it's essential that you must know how to handle and how to take care of your knives. That's right, your knives. I never really learned how to do this, and God knows my wife and I, we love to cook. It's, it's just our passion. And I watched this gentleman, and I saw him go through all of, the, all of his techniques of, of taking care of the knives and explaining the different kind of knives that exist, and I just said to him, you have got to come on my show and tell the world about all the things that you can do. So without further ado, I'm going to get right down to it and introduce to you Chef Paul Magro. Paul. Hi, Harvey. How are you today? Great, great. It's terrific to have you here, and I'm so glad that you accepted the challenge and the invitation to come well, down here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really well, appreciate it. You did it. such a great job at the New York Guild of Chefs that night, and it was, it was terrific. So uh, let's get right down to it, because you got a lot of information in that head of yours. I saw it that night. It was really <laughs> just, just amazing. Um, first, y your background is your senior instructor at the Barry Tech. At Barry Tech. That's correct. Right, okay. And your senior instructor in teaching students what? Well, Dentistry? <laughs> that, I think is your forte. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, actually, we teach everything from uh, sanitation all the way through soup stocks, sauces, pastries, and of course, uh, one of the major players is cutlery. We teach all about that and how to select. So basically, this is a culinary school. Yes, it is. Okay, I want people to yeah. make sure you hear oh, yeah. say sanitation. And right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, career and technical education. Right. right, no, they're very important, very important. I'm very impressed with you. So uh, I want to get right down to it now on, on knives. Mm -hmm. So much to ask you. Um, when I say who, I'm not necessarily going to ask you today because we're not doing any product endorsement here. But right. I'm, I'm interested when I say um, countries. Um, wh where do you get the best knives from? <laughs> or, or you're going to qualify it. Yeah, I really do. Um, if I do mention or slip up and mention a name, it's only because I have used that product. I don't get a dime from anybody, nor do I ever want to. Right. Because that way I can keep everything honest. Correct. Um, years ago, I got to tell you, um, when I first started out, Germany was France and Germany. They were there. I'd say Germany a little bit better because they had hardening and tempering uh, issues that were much better than France. Okay. But uh, now, I mean, Japan makes amazing knives, you were telling me. Oh, absolutely. Japan is a key player in today's market. Uh, they've really come far. One of the things that uh, Japan is now doing, it's, it really started from MacArthur. And around he World brought War knives with him. Not yeah, he did. Well, actually, <laughs> when he conquered Japan, he sort of helped us out a lot. Uh, all those katana makers, they needed a job. Well, you know what? They decided to shorten it and... Out came great cutlery. No kidding. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a fact. And we really uh, benefited from that. You know, of course, all the martial artists uh, didn't have a good time, but, you know, <laughs> every chef was in his glory at that point in time. Okay. We're going to get down to it because uh, in a moment, I don't want you to jump into it, um, th discuss this difference between, like you call it, Western knives yes. and, and, a, and a Japanese knife. Yes. Okay. Um, should we do that right now and just discuss the difference between yeah, the two? Yeah, we can do that. What, what's, what's a Western knife? And then what is a, an Asian or is it Japanese? Well, actually, it's, uh, why don't we call it a chisel edge versus a V-edge. Okay, what's a V-edge? Well, a V-edge literally is a V, all right? Okay. Somewhere okay. around like that, and it looks like a V, which means it's sharpened on both sides to create that V. Comes to a point. Correct. And if you look at it, it looks like a, a pyramid or, or, or a yeah, V. Yeah, it looks like v. an upside-down V. Upside-down V. Yeah. Okay. And where 
uh, I say a Japanese edge or a chisel edge, that's actually straight on one side, comes an angled, and then it's a 45 degree angle or about 38 degrees. So, so from the very tip, you've got a little 45 degree angle, and then it becomes straight again? Right. If I can. Uh, yeah, sure. Pick up this one. All yeah, right. I'm not going to start with you today. You got to yeah. knife. And the, all the knives are pointing towards me. Anyway, well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, it's one of those things. Hey, you know, <laughs> nothing personal. I gave you some handles, too. Some good ones, too. You've got some of the carbon ones. I see that. Well, this is, as you can see, this edge over here, this angle. I don't know if it's easier to you know see what? it from. L let me hold it. And, yeah, and maybe. We'll, we'll uh, you know the camera's better than I do. I don't know. Okay, let me, I'm going to hold this and let's see. Oh, cool. I see now what you mean by this. Let me see if uh, my. Oh, good. You got to get close up to me. Now, I see right over here. Well, at first, it's straight here and then it goes in. That's correct. Okay, and now on the other side, it's completely straight. That's correct. It goes straight down. Yes, oh, it I does. I can feel it here. Wow, I see the difference yeah. here. Wow, great. Okay, so now please take care of Absolutely. that and, and explain. So what happens is with this knife, um, we can think of uh, everyone has three quarters. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go to sharpen this, all right, I usually try to find, keep it flat against the stone, all right, and follow the natural angle that the maker put in there. All right, and then at the very end, what you do is actually you sharpen one side until you create a burr for, uh, throughout the whole knife. You get a, in other words, the, the whole knife, the length is going to be a little burr. Yeah, it's going to not, not, not pieces of burrs. No, it's going to actually roll over. It's going to roll over. Yeah. Again, what do you do then with that uh, that burr? Well, the next thing is after you do it on that first side, you want to flip it over and take that burr off, and that'll actually give you a real clean, sharp edge. By no means finished yet, but a good sharp edge. So when you do that on the other side to get rid of that burr, am I correct? You're almost uh, perpendicular with the uh, with the stone. Yeah, you're just raising it just a hair just up. There. I would say uh, maybe a dime. Okay. A dime thickness. Okay. So because otherwise you're going to wind up getting a V. Yeah, exactly. If I would have kept it at the same angle, and you're 100% correct, if I would keep it at the same angle, angle like I did a Western knife. Right. Uh, then you would end up with a V. Okay, let's take, uh, well, no, before we get to the Western knife, mm -hmm. so now when you have that Japanese knife. Correct. And you have that Japanese knife, wh why, what's the benefit of, of doing that as opposed to a V? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people have asked that, like, Chef, why would you even want yeah, that? Who cares? Oh, yeah, right? Obviously I mean, come on, as long as it cuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, it does. Even though uh, a Western knife has a V to it, mm -hmm. it tends to mash product. Now, that's not going to really be a life-threatening situation when you're doing carrots or, or right. potatoes or something like that. But when you go to use marinate, when you want to marinate fish, and when you want to make ceviche and things like that, when you slice through sushi. that. Sushi. Sushi, exactly. When you want to have that cut, a Western knife will actually mash the edge of that. No kidding. It'll, it'll yeah. at, at a it very actually small level. Yeah, a small level. It will microscopically mash it. And what happens is you're going to marinate. The marinate doesn't penetrate as readily. So because, is it because you have so much protein in the fish and the protein's tough? Well, the protein is tough, and, you know, the, you want the coagulation of that protein from the acids that are entering into it. Right. And it enters into, into it more readily with open pores. I see. So by taking a Western knife and mashing it, even if it is fairly sharp, it's not going to be as sharp so, as a Japanese knife. So this edge. Japanese knife, this Japanese edge, will be more like using a razor blade. There you go. Or chisel, like anybody that's worked with woodworking. A real sharp chisel. A real sharp chisel. Wow. Okay. All right. So you explain that. Um, can you can you show um, show me um, how you you sharpen knives and how you take care of knives? Absolutely. And, um, and explain the stones and the different kind of stones. Sure. And what that means for people who don't even know what we're talking about. Well, I'm going to jump back maybe just a hair Go if ahead. I can. Go ahead. And talk about the different steels because that also means... Go uh, right ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. What you'll, you'll see here is as you come here, this is a, a little shinier. This tends to be a little duller. Right. These ones that are a little duller, all right, and most of the handles are actually facing you for these uh, knives. Right. Um, they're made of carbon steel. The duller is well, carbon yeah, steel? That looks a little bit duller. Carbon steel. Now, carbon steel started out many, many years before stainless because that's all we know about. Right. Phenomenal edge. 
phenomenal edge. Meaning it holds its edge as well as being able to get it sharp? Well, it has the ability to get it sharp, extremely sharp, more so than I believe the stainless of today. Really? But the stainless will hold it slightly longer. I see. But it will never achieve the sharpness that uh, carbon. Carbon, carbon steel will. Oh, okay. Really? All right. But it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I think uh, viewers should know about. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, are harder to find, but I got to tell you, when you use that knife. You don't go back. It's like Stradivarius. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, really? it's unbelievable. Okay, that, that's good to know. So carbon, in your estimation, is yeah. the way to go. Yeah, for me, for professionals. And it's durable. Uh, not so much stainless, I think it's more durable. You said that, right. Uh, you but gotta be careful about acid foods, oh. lemons, eggplant, uh, anything that has tomatoes. Food. Yeah, oh So you yeah. gotta wash them really, really good. Yeah. Air, air, we should be doing that anyway, but you gotta wash right. them. And you, you have to wash them, you have to really dry them uh, every now and then. A little bit of mineral oil is always great. Wow, it's like taking care of a cast iron pot. Exactly. Same thing. Exactly. Okay. So continue. If you're uh, willing to sacrifice some of the edge sharpness, by all means, for the average person, I think stainless is probably the way to go. Okay. It just takes uh, a little bit more abuse, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, when you're going to do um, a sharpen, a Western knife, and this happens to be one of the newer knives. These are called Santucos. Let me see, Santuco? Yep. That's a Santuco. Santuco. And it's a Western knife. Actually, it's made in Japan, yeah, but, it's, yeah, but it's a Western knife. It's a Western knife, yeah. because I see there's Japanese writing on here, or does that say Paul in a funny kind of way? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm going to resist the desire to touch the blade. Okay, why do, why do we do stupid things? Anyway, um, okay, so now this is Santuco, and it's, uh, it's got a really super-duper sharp blade, Western. Yeah, it's a Western. Uh, it's nice and bad. Look at that. It's great. Yeah, my son Look actually found on that one. Uh, yeah, what have you got yeah. this here? I get a shoot of this. Yeah, I'm yeah. not even really holding it. It's just balanced. It really is wow, balanced. Wow, it feels well. really good. Okay. And that's critical when you uh, go to buy knives. Explain. Well, um, that's like trying on a pair of shoes. You like to say, well, gee, I'm a size 12, but they all fit great. Never happens. Right. Not it. I wish it did. <laughs> Life would be great. But it isn't. Everybody's hand is different, and everybody's perception of what feels great in the hand is different. So try out your knives like you try out a pair of shoes. Absolutely. Okay, good Absolutely. advice. Absolutely. Good advice. Okay, so let's continue. So now you got your Western, and we're going to go into uh, sharpening? Yeah, okay, and I before... I just want to warn my crew. See if we can get a close-up here of, of Paul. Um, and uh, when you do this, just keep the steel, uh, I'm sorry, keep the, uh, the, the stone uh, uh, stationary. So otherwise, right. you know, a camera person is going to go nuts, ch you know, chasing you around. Absolutely. Okay, let's see if we can get uh, one, of the, one of the things I like to jump in and say, these are diamond stones. Right. Years ago, they used to use carborundum. Right. Now, carborundum, in its day, that was all we had. Right. Welcome to diamonds. A little bit of money, well worth the investment. Uh, they'll last forever. Literally yeah. forever. I retired my first one after 23 years. Okay. And wow. And hard service. Wow. Um, that white stone or that you have over there is a Japanese water stone, oh. which is uh, a real, real nice stone. And usually you soak those with water before we use them. How long? Usually about a half hour. Well, it feels powdery. There's like a yeah. powder. Can, what, what? It's, that's 8,000 grit. And, and, this, and the diamond? This diamond here is 1,200 grit, although they go all the way down to uh, roughly about 250, okay. which is fairly larger stones, but when you have no edge on a knife at all, where it's almost rounded. Um, as we told before, we have that V, mm -hmm. all right? And with that V, when you use a knife, it gets a little bitty X on that side. No kid, you get an X. Yeah. So you're getting like weird burrs. Exactly. You're getting burrs on both sides of that edge. Now, years ago, we would use uh, a butcher's steel, something like this. To right. Just, microscopically take off those edges and that would actually this steel would actually clean it and if you feel it it's fairly fine yeah yeah very you know, fine very very fine and what you would do is that would take that tiny little x and then true it back up to so a it's going to upright it a little bit it's exactly. not gonna, it's not going to take it off physically you're not going to have particles or will you yes you will it'll you actually will take those microscopic particles back off you rewash your knife and then you're good to go again oh, okay in the butcher shop what they usually do is and that's where i started out many many years ago you would take an old piece of fat or something and run it through the fat 
and then discard the fat. Wow, interesting. Okay, so you know we're we're waiting here with bated breath. Okay, and see, here we go. And I want you to explain when you say three quarters. Yeah. What, what that means. Well, I don't want people to think you're talking in fractions, but you mean three I mean, twenty-five cent pieces. Three twenty-five cent pieces. Just happen to have three twenty-five uh, cent pieces. You, you, you must know, have gotten paid last week. Yeah. All maybe right. my wife didn't get this one. Huh? <laughs> Be careful, she's watching the show. Yeah, probably. Yeah. All right, and basically three American quarters. Okay, wait, wait. Let's see if we get a close-up of, of of this. We got the three quarters on there. Great, perfect. Okay, perfect. And then I would like you to think about it, and I'm going to actually do this move backwards. The cork. Just move the cork. Give it a minute. Okay. I'm going to do you. this sort of backwards, so the audience can see this. All right, that's the angle you would actually like to keep on it. So the edge is touching the stone. Right. And the back end, w w that's the top end of the knife. Is resting yeah. on top. So now you got your, what would you say that is, 30 degrees? Uh, probably about 20, anywhere between 18 and 22. Okay, fine. somewhere around there. Okay. Um, it's not so much important as uh, to the, along this. Mm -hmm. The key really is to develop your hand to hold the edge on both sides. Without the quarters. Correct. Without the quarters. Now, here's a rule of thumb that uh, I've always used and it serves, has served me well. You better watch your thumb. Oh uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, um, if you're going to use harder vegetables, you want the angle a little bit oh, higher up. Oh, oh, oh. All right? Oh. So, uh, Sharper? You, you, actually, it's, uh, it's more of a working edge. The V, instead of being very thin, which would be great for filleting and boning knives, all right, and that would be maybe one quarter's worth. Oh. By pushing out to three or four, it would be that kind of an edge. So you've got more bulk to mash. Right. You would actually take that and would actually drive it through. The edge wouldn't be as brittle. So you would actually have a, a more of an edge that would take a little bit more abuse with harder vegetables rather than a razor edge. This is great edge. learning all this stuff. I love this. Keep going. I'm going to okay. sit back and watch you. Go all right. Ahead. Now I'm going to remove this and I will keep this. Now there are two ways you can approach this. Go okay? Ahead. Yeah. You can approach this from this side yes. going all the way down. All right. Try to use as much stone as you can. You paid for it. You might as well use it. All right? All the way like that. Whatever you do on one side, it's like math with a western edge. You've got to do it on the opposite side. So you would take it from here and take it the same way. I see. So you're using the whole length of the, right. of the diamond stone and getting all of the... And I see you're really not killing yourself. You're being, you're being no, gentle. No, no. You, you know what? You don't let the stone do, do the, the work. work. Right. Right? If the more you force it down, actually, the more material you'll actually move with, remove with diamonds. And there's no need to. All you really want to do is get your edge back. This is good. Okay. You know, so and show us a little bit. Do. do a little bit now so people can see. See if we can get a close-up on this. Keep doing it some more. Oh, I like the sound. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a great ring to it. It almost yep. talks to you. Now, there's no oil on that diamond, is there? No. Diamonds don't require any oil or water. Years ago, the carb run them either water or oh, oil. Right. Japanese stones, water. water stones, henceforth, water. That stone next to you is in that little box, if you lift that up, that actually is a novolite. And that a novolite? Was, yeah, novolite. What, what is novolite? Something from novolite the is a, a natural rock known as an Arkansas stone. Oh, yeah. And that's been uh, around for a real, real long time, and I'm right. sure... Uh, You've seen some sure, uh, Arkansas black stones. I know that. Yeah, and in your profession. Yeah, uh, we yeah. use all this. Use absolutely. absolutely. You know, there's a lot of overlapping between the two. Right. Wow. So. Uh, okay. So now, again, is am I correct in stating your choice is a diamond? My personal choice is a diamond. Okay, fine. I happen to like that. I think they work out best. A lot of different companies out there. I won't say one is better or worse than the other. I just say, you know, find something you like. Now. You've done this. You've done th this. is the first step because I remember when you, when you did this. There are multiple right. steps. Yeah, there now, are multiple no, stones. Multiple stones. What's the next thing now? Now okay. you've, you've done. Let's this. Let's say you've I've uh, taken. Uh, you know, let's say the knife was extremely dull, mm -hmm. and I'd go through maybe three diamond stones. The only reason why is it goes from very coarse to uh, medium Fine. coarse. So it'd be like from 250 to 400, 600, and then I would end on 1200. Ah, uh, which will be your finest. That's my finest. But at that point. It still has those microscopic burrs, right. and what do you do? Got to get it off. Got to get it off. Now, there's several methods of doing this. One of my favorite is 
using that leather strap over right, there. Like the old barber used to there use. There you go. Absolutely. You take uh, an old barber, if you would uh, assist me. Sure. I'm not an old barber, there you but go. yeah, you said take an And barber, yeah. what you would do is, strap. what I like to do is, we'll flip this over. Ah, rouge. Jewelers rouge. Yeah, we use that in dentistry for polishing gold. There you go. Well, we're going to polish an edge. Right, okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to put on your rouge. I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you never know when you need it. <laughs> Give it a nice little bright color. Okay. All right, and you're going to strap it against the knife like Same such angle? as what? Same angle. Same angle. Same angle. All right, and you would do it the same way. So I, I'm noticing you're you're going away. You're, yep. you're not going towards the edge. No, nope, because the edge go I'm I'm creating rather than going into the edge, I want to peel that edge back, and I just want to create that ultra fine end. And then I'll flip this over and actually take the smoother side ah. and go one step further. It's going to wipe off all that. And there pieces. it is. And that's it. Yeah. Wow. And that's how your knife is actually finished. What I tend to do at that point in time is check the edge, and I can usually usually use a finger. How about a, ha a hair? You know. Okay. Well, <laughs> John, I don't think my uh, hand-eye coordination is that good, but if yours is, by all <laughs> means. And I'll check to make sure that the burr on each side is all the way off. Another way is checking is a piece of paper. You can actually, yeah, slice it. If it goes through paper readily, you're good to go. Good to Not go. Yeah. That's great. No then after this, obviously, you're going to wash the knife. I'm just yes. making, making this yeah. clear, you know. Yeah, you need to wash the knife before you ever go near any uh, product and dry it well and then uh, start preparation for dinner. A couple of uh, myths yes. that I want you to debunk or corroborate. Okay. One, do you put a knife in a dishwasher? And why not, or why yes? Okay, never put a knife in a dishwasher. Why? All right, good point. You just, not because, like Mad Rose says, no. <laughs> There's a, some science behind it. Go ahead, it. Paul. Between the hardening and uh, tempering process, one of the first sta stages is to harden most of the stainlesses at 300 degrees. 300 degrees. All right, that's the first step. Uh -huh. And there's several steps beyond that. Correct. So one of the problems you have is the average dishwasher, because we being lazy Americans, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, for dishes, it's great. It heats up to 350, Boom. dries all that water off, makes our lives easy. Problem is, nasty for, for really good cutlery. Now, you know what? Your butter knife is in there. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. But for really, you know, when you spend a ton of money on cutlery, you really don't want to abuse it like that. And if it's got a wood handle, it's going to soak in, it's going to uh, get brittle and crack. And it's just not the way to go. It's just okay. hand wash. Okay. So that's, hand that's wash, fine. dry, and put away. Second little myth here. Yeah. You should, this is the statement that you hear. Never put knives in a drawer <laughs> all together with all the knives there. Yeah. How do you store knives? And obviously your face is telling me, never do that. Magro <laughs> says, hands yeah. on heads. Magro says, never do yeah. that. Magro says, you okay. really don't want to do Why? that. Why? Why would you not take a drawer full of knives? Well, the problem is, is knives have sharp edges. They're going to knock against knives with sharp edges. Therefore, you're going to create microscopic nicks in the knife itself. So all the hard work you put into sharpening it, Boom. you've not negated it. Okay. So that it's a real problem. Now, one of the ways you might want to think about is you can invest a little money, and they have these inserts for the drawers. That's what I got. Yeah, aren't That's they great? great. I love oh, them. The wood, wood, insert, yeah. wood insert, and it's got, it's got sl uh, slots. Yeah. And I just put my knives in them. Every child to a spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. You, you really have to take care of your knives. Yeah. Now, why are there different knives? For example, uh, my, my uh, bread knife will have a little bit of a serration to it. Correct. And uh, it's it, et cetera, et cetera. It, it'll look like, is this a bread knife? Yeah, actually, uh, that's an offset knife, but I've used oh, it yeah, for bread many, many a knife. I see on uh, one side you have the edge, and the other side you don't. Absolutely. Oh. And it, it is serrated. Why? Well, the way they make that, as you is, pointed out, for bread, for hard things. It's also when it's no wait for tomatoes. Tomato yeah. has that tough outer yeah, skin. Yeah, 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 you know, absolutely. So it's hard to get, you know, yeah, hard yeah, to break lightly it. Right. So, so this is perfect for bread and tomatoes, yeah. anything that's got that tough skin. Yeah, that knife was actually made um, by a gentleman um, that started out many in the early 60s. He started that knife and had a German company make it for him. And he went around 
door to door. His name was Ludwig Schiff, but he is, his, his daughter's taken over the company. One of the first knives he sold to deli. It was a perfect deli knife. Well, chefs grabbed hold of it, great for cutting potatoes, great for tomatoes, great for sandwiches, great for bread. Yeah, um, so he developed this knife. Yeah, he developed it with um, uh, his friends in Germany, and right. he s used to sell it, uh, you know, door to door, knock on your door as a chef, and he goes, I'm here, and uh, all the guys would go out and buy it. But uh, most people don't know this. You can actually touch those knives up. W you mean to sharpen them even more? Yeah. You well, well, how does one explain briefly? We, we, we only have a few minutes left. We're almost out of time. Okay. I can't believe this. Yeah. Time goes by so quickly with you. How do you, how do you sharpen a serrated edge? Well, what you can do is you need a, a diamond oh, rat tail. Circular rat tail. Yeah, the rat tail as they call it. Thick goes to thin. Show me. What you would do is you Let's place see if you can get it. In here. Great, they got you. All right, all right. This should be up a little higher. I'm going to actually pop it on here, just for uh, for this. Right. And you would actually hold the same angle as this, and you would go back and forth to each serration. All right. What this is going to do is create a little burr on the other side. Right. What you're going to then do is knock that burr off. Okay. Wow. And that will bring it back up eventually. So it takes more work and effort. I mean, obviously, you mm -hmm. can't be lazy here. No. I mean, you got to take care no. of these knives. That's, that's terrific. We're really almost out of time here. I can't believe this. Paul, what I'd like you to do is um, uh, give me a couple of words of wisdom, uh, tips that people watching the show, be it that there are professionals or there are homebodies who cook like myself. Give me some, some quickie tips on knives. Well, quickie tips is try to keep your edges sharp. A sharp knife is definitely safer than a dull knife. You can get carbon, except it might not last as long as stainless steel. That's correct also. It won't, uh, and those are going to have to search out a little bit. Uh, the Japanese make some of the best carbon as of right now. Right. They're hardening and tempering, and their Rockwell hardness, which is the, the hardness the on the edge, hard, right. is definitely better. And uh, there's, of course, the custom market that, uh, you know, will actually make knives for you that actually put stainless, like this one. Right. It actually has stainless on the outside, but has white, Hitachi white steel on the inside. That's very interesting. Um, are you going to say that, in your opinion, if you really want to get great knives, don't buy a kit? Yeah, never buy a set. And uh, one of the reasons why I would never buy a set is manufacturers somehow make some knives really good and others, others eh. eh and I would I don't buy sets I have you know I've invested quite a bit of time and uh, money into this but I found out that you know some things that uh, you're gonna have to have you know don't buy sets buy so that's why when I'm pieces. looking at your knives here right now I see yeah. they're all different yeah and I shouldn't be uh, uh, seduced by the fact that they all should look the same you nope. know, made by XYZ brand no not at all one of the things you're going to do if you're starting off... have got about 30 off, seconds left, my friend. Okay, uh, for the fast 30 seconds, if you're going to start off, you're going to need a boning knife, a chef knife, a boning knife, a paring knife, and a slicer. Mm -hmm. Those are the rudiments. That'll start. get you about through 90% of everything wow. you want to get in the, done in the kitchen. Wow, terrific. Would you come back again in the future and discuss other aspects of being in the kitchen? Absolutely. I'd be terrific. glad to. Number one, you're knowledgeable, you're expert, you're a knife smith, you really know your stuff, you're terrific... But more importantly, I learned something from you. You're a teacher. You really know how to communicate, and you're very affable. You're pleasant. You're articulate, and you're right to the point. Thank you very Chef much. Chef Paul. Harvey. Appreciate it. Thank Good you man. So much. Good man. Always love spending time with you, and I can, I, I can learn from you. It's the highest compliment I can pay you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And uh, I hope you had a good time because I learned a lot. And use this. This is great stuff. So next time you want to buy a knife, you now know what to do from Chef Paul. So... Right now, well, before I say goodbye, say goodbye to everybody and hello again at the New York Guild of Chefs. Okay, so, so long for now, Dr. Passes. We'll see you again next time. And whatever you do, like Chef Paul Magro, do it with passion. See you again next time. All right, with our cutlery, things to look for are full tang. All right, this is metal that goes all the way through the knife itself. These knives are dropped forward, basically they pour the steel into a mold. They take it out, and it becomes all one. The handles are basically phenolithic resins. 
Years ago, they were wood. There are some wood handles and knives, but most of uh, the large companies have gone to phenolithic resins or plastic. Reason for is sanitation. All right, not so much safety. When they get uh, greasy, they actually slip more in the hand. But the Board of Health loves them because they're impervious to bacteria. So with these knives, these come out of Germany, uh, Japan, United States, Italy. A lot of places have good knives. The key is to find something that you're happy with. All right, it's like buying a pair of shoes. If you're not happy with it, it's not going to fit right. You've got to physically pick up that knife and feel it. All right? In a Western knife, most of them balance over here at the bolster. Some tend to be handle heavy. This one's a little handle heavy. Where this is a Japanese knife, and but it's in a Western configuration, it gives you more of a balance. All right? New Japanese knives, again, Western configuration. It's double edged to a V. This one has shiny laminations, which basically means it's a Damascus steel made out of stainless steel. They put two sides on it, two slabs as they call it, sweat it or weld it together with a core of VG10, which is a very incredibly hard stainless steel, usually to 63 Rockwell. Rockwell is something that we gauge knives by. Years ago, the old-fashioned carbon ones were approximately 53 to 54. They take an incredible edge real fast, but the edge died real fast. These take a little bit longer to get on. But with the invention of diamonds and stones, and that's the only way to go, in my opinion, carbon run them you know, for five, ten dollars. By the time you use it, abuse it, you go through five or ten of them a year, you might as well have diamonds. I've had diamond stones last 23 years. First one died last year on me. And I bought some more of them. They're going to last forever. Now, when sharpening a knife, you can either go from heel to tip or from tip to heel. Either one is correct. It doesn't matter as long as you keep your edge the same angle there. What I tend to use, experts say, well, anything between 18 and 22. Here's the deal that I use. I use three quarters stacked up. Now that's for an average knife. If I'm going to have a fillet knife, I might only use two, maybe one quarter. If I'm gonna use a, a thicker edge, which means that V is no longer like this, it's a little wider, then I'm going to put four quarters or that equivalent underneath especially if I'm going to use that knife for uh, opening and cutting lobsters and things like that that have a, a tougher exoskeleton. So with this, I'm going to basically continue to do it each way, as many times on it each way, And by doing this, you can feel it, and it's starting, you can almost see it, it's starting to pick up a little bit of shine to it. That's how you can tell how your edges are going. All right? Now, this is starting to just start that V there, which is really nice. All right? I'm going to continue on a very coarse stone until I get a little bit more of a V. You could use a, a lesser grit stone, or a finer one, the problem is, is you're going to have to take longer at it. My idea is get a bunch of stones, get a collection of them, and use the least amount of time per stone but giving you the maximum results. Starting to pick it up a little bit better when you get into it, just a little bit more. Yeah. 
There you go. Much better now. Right where I want it to be. I'm going to switch over. Stones. <clears throat> A little bit coarser. The beauty of diamonds is you don't have to put any lubricant on there. If you want to, you can, but it's not needed. After, a, after you build up uh, the material, and that's the knife particles and the metal, you'll find that it slips slightly. All you need is a wet rag, move it back and forth, and it will pick up that material for you. Okay? In essence, it doesn't get any better than this. You don't have to sit there with lubricating oils and cutting oils will drive you nuts. This is a pretty clean operation. Even better at this point in time. Going to move on to a finer, 1200 grit. When you have the desired edge that you're looking for, there are two ways to remove the microscopic burr. Well, one way is the old-fashioned way we take it, put it on a steel and take it off. That way is very good, works great. But even after the steel, I find that it doesn't grab everything. So I kind of shortcut, don't even go to the steel, and I go to I pick it up from my ancestry. My grandfather was a barber, left me an old belt, and it worked great. There are some ways of reinventing the wheel, though. By using a leather strap, you can also put a jeweler's rouge on it. You know what, Harvey, I think I'm going to come in front of you. As long as I can get on top. Now I can see on the mirror. Are you going to stay by the mirror? Well, I don't know if you can get it from back here, can you? What? Okay. This more for Okay, we on? Yep. That's a jeweler's rouge. All right. Some jeweler's rouge. Dental rouge, too, by the way. Ah, there you go. <laughs> All right. What I'm going to do is basically... Just take off that bar with it. All right, and there you have it. The edge is now polished and sharp. All right, this is how we take care of Western knives. Hold it up. No. Let me get it closer. Better. All right, and this is how we keep care of our knives. Of course, needless to say, do not put knives in a dishwasher, especially a household dishwasher, that heats up the metal to 350 degrees, which is now driving the temper out of the knife. All right, it's critical. All of a sudden, you spend some great money on a serious knife, by putting it into that machine, you have now destroyed the knife by taking the temper out. All right, hand wash them, they'll be fine. Next we have Japanese knives. Japanese knives, anybody that's done any woodworking will tell you that the edge is a chisel edge. All right, these require a little bit different technique, but nonetheless, it's still fine. 
What you're going to do is, because they're only really sharpened on one side, unlike a Western knife, on the angled side, it actually will mirror onto your stone. What you're going to do at that point is push it, holding that same angle. That's critical. By holding the same angle, two things are going to occur. Japanese knives are laminated. What I mean by that is this front steel is a soft steel. The back piece back here is a hard steel. So what you're having is one steel, soft, one steel, hard. Soft is in front. So when you place it down on your stone, it's going to take the material off rather quickly. But yet the harder steel in the back will require a little bit more to get it sharp. So as you're pulling the steel away from it, what I'm doing is actually creating a burr. And that's nothing more than a piece of metal that's actually going to loop over. And I'm going to feel for that burr. When I have it in certain spots, I will then work further down the knife until I have that burr totally there. All right? And after I work that burr on that knife, so it literally rolls over, I will then push the knife and remove the burr slightly. I will keep it almost flat, maybe one or two degrees up, just to take that burr. All right? After that, I will put it on the jeweler's rouge and the belt, just like I did with the Western knife. Now, why would I take this knife over this knife? Come on, chef, they both cut. Well, yes, they do. The difference is the edge. This, although it is sharp, when you want to marinate raw fish and things like that, this will still mash the flesh. All right? It will not give that crisp, clean edge. I find that when I cut fish with a Japanese edge, all right, an angled edge, I'm going to get a cleaner, better cut. So therefore, it won't turn mealy. It'll firm up a lot better in a marinade and things like that. Some things that might not matter. Some things it's, it's very important and it does matter, especially when it comes to fish technique. With meat, if I'm going to put it on a grill, I don't really find the difference. Uh, it's got much more... It's got a tougher, uh, you know, fiber to it, uh, the meat does, so it can withstand a slight mashing. Where fish, uh, the structure is much more delicate. So what happens is that protein structure, you want to cleanly cut it quickly and as cleanly as possible. It definitely cooks up better, definitely marinates better. One of the things that you will find with Japanese knives as well as old-fashioned carbon steel knives, right? This has got little pockets of rust on it. Well, how do we get rid of that rust? All right? And that rust basically forms by, well, I wash the knife, or I cut an acidic uh, food with it, such as a lemon, a lime, maybe an eggplant. All right? This will turn it a dark color. So in order to polish this up, one of the best ways I have found is to take some scouring powder, whether it be Ajax, Comet, uh, there's nine million out there, just pick one. All right, it doesn't really matter which one you have, this is all about the technique. What you want to do is get some water, all right, and we'll do that by wetting the blade itself. wetting a cork, placing the powder on the cork. And at this point, we're going to shine that blade.
Now at this point we're taking off that rust. The next question we're going to have to ask ourselves is, how do I avoid that rust coming back? All right? When you have it There's your edge. At this point, we're going to clean it and dry it. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, this is fine. All right? This looks great. I would do this one better. By coating it, and I would only coat this with mineral oil. Can I use olive oil? Can I use canola oil? Absolutely. You can use any one of those. Downside. They're going to get gummy and sticky. All right? Mineral oil, and you get a good grade of mineral oil from a pharmacy. It is definitely edible. In uh, years gone by, that they used to give it to people, uh, you know, for various reasons. So, by putting the mineral oil on there, you're going to stop that oxidation. And that's what's actually creating that rust on there. I hope I've given you some uh, insights on keeping knives sharp. And have fun out there. Be safe. And a safe knife is a sharp knife. So keep it that way. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Uh, for even my Japanese knives, before I go on to water stones, I'll set the edge with it. It just it gets you there right away. You can go to any oil body shop and get 2,000 grit of wet sandpaper, wrap it around the stone, and use work. the knife that way, and it'll do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was an apprentice, in fact, 60 some years ago, uh, in Switzerland, they used to, we only used to use the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the steel, uh, carbon steel. Carbon steel, yeah. 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 Oh, and we carbon. used to clean them with a cork at HX. Yeah. And then same the thing. mineral oil. Exactly the same way. It hasn't really changed. I wouldn't say it, it changed. You want to know why? It works. It hasn't changed since. I won't, I won't change it because it works. It works yeah. great. Uh, you can use mineral oil. You can use water. The key is to finish it off yeah. with mineral oil because you want to stop that oxidation. And what's great about mineral oil is right before you use it, it's food safe. You know, it's perfectly edible. So there's no reason why not to use something like that. Paul, where would you buy your diamond uh, diamond? You know, there are, a, there are a lot of diamond companies out there. Uh, I don't make any money. I've been using Egilap Diamond. Personally, I just happen to like it. But Norton puts it out. There's some Japanese firm. I mean, go check them out yourself. You know, see what's out there. Uh, I won't say one is any better than the next, but I will tell you this, buy diamond because it's the way to go. Diamond will outlast <coughs> anything out there. Well, can you probably get it at Restaurant Depot? Um, you know what? I don't know. I know if you search the web that, you know, there are 9 million ones out there. And they range from, you know, price to price. Um, I've been uh, using, like I said, Easy Lap, and I've turned a lot of chefs onto it. Uh, I know there's Chef Choice out there. That's the one that uh, we sell here at uh, Local Fish. It's very coarse. It's very coarse. It's very coarse diamond. I, I happen to like, I think diamonds, you know, as you use them, they work well for you. Now, how do you tell if a diamond stone is still good? Well, you take a glass and you rub it on the diamond stone, and if it cuts glass, we all know diamonds cut glass. So if it continues to cut or braid that glass, by the way, don't do it with your wife's braid. You know, <laughs> glasses, otherwise you're going to be living in Chateau Bow Wow. You know? <laughs> but yeah, that's the only way I, you know, I test it out. Get a cheap glass and go for it. What does the typical, uh, if you're not a professional chef, and you have a, a nice set of knives with no edge on it, Okay. What, what's the typical Well, for, for home, okay, there are two ways to go. It's one is, you know, uh, you can buy a set and, and work it yourself, or you can have it professionally done. I know here at uh, Loaves and Fishes, a uh, gentleman named Charlie Robinson, phenomenal, phenomenal guy. Yeah, he's and he chef. does... He does some really, I've known him 20 years, excellent, excellent mechanic. I mean, he really knows his stuff. And I have no problem giving him, you know, give him my knives, except I take care of my own. But, I mean, if I didn't, I've sent people to him in the past. And I would, you know, I wouldn't hesitate. As a child, I 
Because I remember the man coming around with his truck. Well, you got to be careful about the ding ding guy. I haven't seen that in years. What exactly did they do? People, homeowners would give them. Yeah, you give them cutlery. The downside to those people is this edge, this knife has been hardened and tempered. What that basically means is through the, the metallurgy process, you're taking the austenite creating marsh knife, which is a hard edge. By heating it up, and that's why you don't put it in the dishwasher at 350 degrees, you're driving the temper out of that. Which is mean if you're taking that metal and making it malleable, where it's going to bend each way. It'll never hold that edge. And it's a real problem. So by doing it by hand or doing it with a water wheel, which is going to keep that temper down, all right, below what you need to have it at, uh, 300 degrees, then you're okay. These other wheels, these guys, hey, you know, they're great for lawnmowers, but, you know, this is not quite, yeah, this is not quite lawnmowers. You know, it's, it, you really want to bring it to a professional, especially if you pay some serious money for it. Well, you know, if it's a $5 knife, uh, give it a shot. You didn't explain the, the artificial grinding. Like when they grind the knife with his shop, like you, you yeah. that whole... Well, what happens is there's, there's what I call sharp, and then there's pseudo-sharp. Pseudo-sharp is, look it, you have a piece of steel. It starts out as a rectangle, all right? Well, if I just take the very top part of that rectangle, such as here, all right, here it is, a knife. If I just cut the corners off, and put a fast edge on each side like this, all right? It'll be, it'll feel sharp. The problem is, is it's going to die in a heartbeat rather than putting in the true that you really need, going from the edge to edge to the middle. And that's called flat grinding. There's also another thing called concave grinding where they actually take more of the metal, all right, on the edge, and they actually grind it real, real thin, quarter of an inch up on both sides. Is that the hollow grinder? That's a hollow grinder, all right? There's a convex edge, which they use for hunting knives, which is okay for working outdoors, but I wouldn't use it for anything uh, chef, yeah, chef related or anything in the kitchen. Why not? You know? Well, the problem is it's uh, great for the military. It'll hold up well. It'll do what it needs to do for that but it won't give you that nice slice that you're looking for. When you go to put it onto products, it's going to mash that product. It's gross. You know? It's not fine. It's not fine. It's a real, it's, you know, it's a serious working it. You know, you go, hey, let me have, you whack out a quick 10 peg or something. Or if you need to dispatch a sentry, it's fine for that. But it's not great for filleting a fish. It's not great for cutting meat. All right? And that's what you really want it for. That's why you really want to have a flat ground. And what I mean by flat ground, they're taking it from this part here, the spine, to the edge, and they grind it all the way flat, both sides, so you get that perfect V. And that's what you're looking for. Well, when you use the steel, uh, do you use the entire surface of the, of, of the, of the knife, uh, or just the edge? You steal the edge? Well, I hold? steal the, you know, the edge, the first, I'd say, probably... Uh, 30 seconds of that edge. Again, a steel, a regular steel, will only realign. What you're doing is, as you have that V, and you use it, it's going to have that tiny little X at the edge. By putting it on a steel, it's going to chew it up to that V, but it doesn't really sharpen it. It just realigns it. Now, with diamonds, it will actually sharpen that edge slightly, but I think you get much more pressure on a stone itself, you know, by actually the movement of uh, taking the metal off than you will with uh, a steel, a diamond steel, and, you know, working it that way, back and forth on it. Standard steel, all right? You can feel it. How do I know if it's still good if I run my fingernails along it? There are little lands and grooves in there. So it should catch it. If it's pure smooth, is it still good? Yes, it is still good, but it won't remove as much metal as you thought it would. Uh, in the butchering trade, they actually have them where they're 
pure chrome takes off very, very little. It just constantly realigns that edge. But as you're using it, you bring it from, there are two ways of doing this. If you're in the beginning and first time, you might want to try something along these lines. Placing it down on the board and just thinly like you're going to carve just a little piece off it, off each side. This is a safe way. If you lose control or if you've never done this before, the most you're going to do is hit the board. All right? The other way is to bring it, slowly peel it off. All right? And that will also take off the excess metal or the burr on each side. How often would you be sharpening knives? Well, I sharpen my knives depending on, obviously, you know, how, do you, how much do you use your knives? Well, if you're constantly using them, uh, as a chef, I would probably do them every other day or every day, depending upon what I was doing. In catering every day, I'd go through two or three of them because you're doing just such volume that, you know, you, ex you get used to working with a certain edge, and if you don't have it, you're just miserable. And the idea is to be happy when you're working. And happiness is when you touch that knife to a product, it glides and zips right through it. And that's where happiness begins, at least for me. Because if you're going to work hard for it, and you're going to put more pressure on it, odds are you're going to slip, and that's where the cuts are. A sharp knife is a safe knife. So I ask you to join me to go to a store, and I want to buy a set of knives. I like to cook, but I don't know the first thing about knives, except that you can kill yourself with it. All right, how can I be a wise knife consumer in my purchase? What do I look for? How do I know I'm getting something decent? Well, first of all, I never buy sets. I never tell anybody to buy sets. Sets are a waste of money. And I'll tell you why they're a waste of money. I don't know of any firm to date that does everything perfect. There's also certain things that I'm going to look for in a knife that other people won't. For the average consumer, you need to pick it up. It's got to feel great in your hand. All right? That's the first thing. Uh, for knives to own, I think an 8 inch uh, chef knife is the way to go. They have these new knives out, or Santucos, which are close to this shape, but they're a little bit more, I would say, beveled, right? Where it'll slightly rock for you. And that's a very, very popular shape. All right, they come in 7 inch, and the Japanese market's got a lot of them. Um, I haven't found a Western firm that does it right yet. You know, uh, my favorite one would be, uh, right now, would be Hattori, unless it was custom made by uh, another gentleman I know, Murray Carter. But, I mean, that's, now you're getting into a, a different market. All right? But for the average consumer, um, you've got to pick it up, you've got to use it, you've got to feel it. The other thing you're going to, the basic things that you're going to need in the kitchen are a chef knife, a bony knife. Um, a slicing knife, and a good paring knife. That will actually get you through most of your day. Now, I mean, I have infinitely way more than that, but I have, you know, I, have, I buy specialty knives for certain things. I am to like curved knives, scimitars for doing meats. I happen to like stiffer, longer, like nine-inch knives for doing fish. I don't like... Um, a flexible knife, where there are chefs that love flexible knives. So you're going to have to think of how you work and what is the best knife for you. I would get it out of a good steel, um, and that's critical. It's got to have, in order to keep a good edge, you have to have at least 0.5% carbon in order to create a knife. Most of the things I would suggest for the average homeowner is stay away from the carbon steels. Carbon steels will give you a better edge, but I'm not sure they're up to the task of polishing them, sharpening them regularly. You're better off with a stainless knife that, you know what, it'll probably be, suit your uh, lifestyle a little bit better. You know, if you're a chef in the trade, by all means, you know, go out and get uh, the carbon steel knives and, you know, 
Welcome to the club. I still got it. Yeah? Yeah, they're great. Yeah, I have that idea. Uh, when, uh, when I want to reconstitute my steel, mm -hmm. I used to take vinegar into a bottle and stick, it in, stick the steel into the bottle that takes all the glue. Like yeah, the what happens is at that point, by doing that, the acids actually corrode the steel and pull it apart. Yeah, you have to be very careful, though. Yeah. Yes, so otherwise you leave it in too long, yeah. you'll end up with holes in it, yeah. pits in it. If you actually uh, just take it after a while and you get a, a wire brush, and I would suggest a, either a copper or a, a bronze brush, and just brush it, and then wipe it down with uh, a wet rag and then dry it with a, a very dry rag, and you're good to go. When it finally goes, it goes. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, these things do happen. I mean, we use them, they do get worn out, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there's some companies that actually make better steels than other. FDIC was always known for their steels, even from way back in the early 60s. Uh, they're from Seoul again there. They're excellent. I mean, that's what they were known for. They also have a decent, uh, you know, uh, array of knives for sure. But uh, their steels are second to none. I haven't found anything better. They actually make a different shape now. Yeah, they have a paddle shape. They have an oval shape that came out probably about 20 years ago. More surface area, right? Well, more surface area. It's good and bad. If you don't know how to roll that knife with it back and forth, you'll actually take dull the edge instead of sharpening the edge. So I suggest rounds for everybody until we, you know, until you really get the feel of that of that uh, blade uh, against the knife of the steel. Any other thoughts, questions? Now we have it. Well, uh, between the plastic cutting board and the wooden cutting board, you find a difference on the edge of your knife, too. Absolutely. The wood lasts longer. Your edges stay longer. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And the other one, your knife goes one yeah, time you're not because you flatten the edge out. Um, I use a variety of cutting boards depending on what I'm using. If I'm breaking down any kind of chicken, fish, etc., I'm going to use a plastic. Right, I can throw it in the dishwasher. It. I'm going to destroy the edge of my knife a lot quicker. Right. And you don't split the you don't split the wood to hold the bacteria. No. But if you do get uh, if you do get an end grain cutting board, what it is is it's